The scripture for this service is Numbers chapter 12, verses 3 and 7. Let me read these two verses for you. Now the man, Moses, was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. Amen. I give thanks to Mongolian Mammy Church members for their testimonies. Senior pastor will deliver a message under the title of The Goodness Part 12. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, and those who are attending this service through the internet and on GCN from the branch churches and from all over the world. In this session, I'll preach about the goodness of Moses. In the last session, I explained that Moses was raised as a son of the daughter of Pharaoh. But he chose to suffer inflictions with the people of Israel rather than to enjoy the pleasure of sin. And how his goodness came out while he went through trials in the Midian for 40 years. He desperately felt he was nothing and had nothing while he was suffering trials in the Midian desert. He experienced that he could do nothing on his own. But he was neither frustrated nor disheartened. He didn't give up. His faith in God became more certain, and so he realized he couldn't survive without God holding on to him. And he was thankful in everything. He lived a life full of toils and pains of a shepherd, tending the flock of his father-in-law. But he was thankful that he could eat without starving and lie down for a moment to take a rest. He was thankful to God in everything. When he passed all the trials with gratitude, his heart became utterly humbled before God and his faith stood absolutely firm. Then God called him. He called Moses so that he could lead the Israelites who cried out to God in pain out of Egypt. Because Moses had fully emptied himself and humbled himself for 40 years at first, he hesitated to accept the God-given task. So God manifested signs and promised him to be with him. And then Moses obeyed his call and marched forward to Egypt. He delivered the words of God to the Israelites, and through his obedience to God's instruction, he finally delivered them from the 400 years of bondage in Egypt. Now, let me explain with what kind of goodness he embraced the Israelites and guided them into the Promised Land as their leader. I urge all of you and all church workers to compare the size and depth of the vessel of your heart with that of Moses. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you may come forth as better vessels in the sight of God. Your brothers and sisters in Christ. The third goodness of Moses, acknowledged by God, was that he was more humble than any man on the face of the earth, as said in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. You should know well how delighted Father God is with humbleness. And you have to examine whether you have humbleness or not. You have to be aware how much Father God loves and delights in your humbleness. The people of God were all humble, including our Lord. All the people of God were so humble. Spiritual humbleness, defined by God, is the tender and kind heart accompanied with virtue. This humble heart accepts everybody and lets many people rest in it, just as a large tree provides shade for 
those who come under it under a, on a hot summer day. It is a tender and comfortable heart that is soft like cotton. How comfortable and relaxed you are you know, being close to people with humble hearts. It feels like you are being embraced. It would be even more so if they were your seniors. If we throw a stone at a piece of metal, it will make noise. If at a piece of glass, the glass will break. When the situation disagrees with his desire, an arrogant and selfish person gives a noisy and rough like a piece of metal. He might give out a clashing noise as well. But when we throw a stone onto a bundle of cotton or thrust it through with a sharp rod, it never makes any noise, but just accepts and embraces and unfolds the object. A meek person accomplishes a tender heart similar to cotton, so he doesn't quarrel with anybody in any situation. Instead, he can keep peace with everybody. He can embrace even those who don't seem right according to his thoughts, and he doesn't judge or condemn anything with wickedness. He can accept, understand, and serve others in a humble manner. He neither has ill feelings toward others, nor causes discomfort to them. Even toward a person who has weak faith and does evil, he waits for him to change without turning his face away. He finds a way for them to improve and leads them and helps them to go that way. Moses was more humble than anybody else on the face of the earth. He led the Israelites out of Egypt into the land of Canaan and suffered numerous difficulties and hardships during that 40-year process. In a mission group or a parish, there are many kinds of personalities among the members who have not changed by the truth. So many things might happen. There are people who complain, offend, slend, or speak ill of, or alienate others. They disobey, make and spread false rumors, and so on. How much more would it be with a big church, with various kinds of people gathered, you know, not you know, knowledgeable, less educated, rich, poor, refined, coarse, and those with honor, authority, and riches. It doesn't, it's not easy to keep peace. No wonder dissension arise. Dissensions arise. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, there were about 600,000 men, and a total of 2 million people followed Moses, including women and children. Actually, it surpassed the 2 million, the number of men being 600,000. It would be 1.2 million with their wives included. How many more if the old men and women and also uh, their children are counted up? It would be way over 2 million. But you know, I'm saying the number was about uh, 2 million. How many hardships Moses must have suffered while he led such a great multitude of people through the rough wilderness? They saw many wonders and miraculous signs that God had formed through Moses, but they hurled many complaints and resented him whenever they met with difficulties. When Moses obeyed with faith, the Red Sea was parted and they walked across it as though they were on the dry land. But after they walked through the desert for just three days, they began to complain against Moses because they found no water. They had actually experienced God's wondrous miracles such as ten plagues and the parting of the Red Sea. If they had had even a little faith, they would not have complained against Moses. They had seen the Red Sea parted just days ago, but asked them to give them drinking water by faith. But they didn't believe in God, the God being with them, although they had witnessed the great power of God. Brothers and sisters, do you believe that God works with us 
And he is present among us. Moses tolerated them in all this at the time. And he cried out to God for them and performed a miracle by changing the bitter water of Marah into sweet water. At Mara, they drank water and continued their walking. Not long after that, however, they began to complain again because there was no food for them to eat. Mara was close to the Red Sea because the Red Sea was, I mean, the Red Sea water came in, it tasted bitter. The words of complaint are written in Exodus 16.3. The sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full? You have to know how important your every single word is. The Bible reminds us that death and life are in the power of the tongue. What are they saying now? Wouldn't that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt? They all died in the wilderness after all. Their next generation entered the Canaan, but they themselves all ended up dying except for Joshua and Caleb, who indeed placed the trust in God without complaining. Therefore, I want to remind you how important the words of your lips are. Would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt? For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. It was like you saved the stranger from the sea and he turned into your enemy. For God answered their cry and appointed Moses to deliver them out of you know, 300 or, uh, 340 years slavery in Egypt. It wouldn't happen enough even if they had constantly given thanks for that. But rather, they showed resentment. For these ungrateful people, Moses again prayed to God to answer their petition. Through his prayer, Moses could provide them with bread to eat in the morning and make their stomachs full with meat in the evening. The people of Israel ate food coming from above every day, and then did they obediently follow Moses? Never. When they set out on their journey from the wilderness of Sin and camped in Raphidim, there was also no water for them to drink. So, they quarreled with Moses and were about to stone him. They said, Why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Moses speechless. How could they say such a way? Though they have eaten manna every day, they came from God. Their behaviors were not forgivable or acceptable at all by common sense, but Moses again went before God and prayed for them. He cried out to God and received the answer. He struck the rock with his staff before the eyes of elders of the people, and then water came out of it. The Israelites complained and grumbled at even small things and doubted whether God was among them. Nevertheless, Moses cried out before God to ask him to hear their demands, and he received answers from God. They, however, committed a grave sin before God and fell into a crisis in which all of them would be destroyed. Moses went up Mount, Mount Sinai to communicate with God over a long period of time. During his absence, they became too unrestrained in heart and molded a calf, and they proclaimed it their God, which had brought them out of Egypt.
God was enraged and said to Moses, "I have sent these people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now, then, let me alone, that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them, and I will make of you a great nation." Now, how did Moses answer God? Did he say, "Yes, they have been unforgivable. Let them be treated by your will"? Mm -mm, no, he didn't say it like that. Exodus 32, verses 11 to 13 says, Then Moses entreated the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and with the mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, With evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens, and all this land of which I have spoken I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. God turned His will and did not pour out His wrath upon them. You gotta know how powerful Moses' prayer was. Even though God had been determined to destroy that great number of people, He gave it into Moses' earnest prayer of love and faith. He answered Moses' prayer. You can see that Moses' prayer was so powerful that it appeased, it appeased God's anger and moved his heart. We can see the same thing happen in this church, right? But what is absolutely unforgivable, God has granted chances of repentance and forgiveness, right? If you can move the heart of God, if you can move the Lord God and cause Him to change the decision of His heart, it means you have surpassing humbleness that resembles our God and our Lord. Such individuals can move the heart of God. When Moses came down from the mountain, he found them committing a grave sin before God. So in Exodus 32, verses 31 and 32, he knelt down before God and prayed, Alas, these people has committed a great sin, and they have made a god of gold for themselves. But now, if you will forgive their sin, and if not, please blot me out from your book which you have written. Here, your book which you have written means the book of life in heaven. Only those whose names are written there are saved. In Revelation, it says, if anyone's name is not found in the book of life, he will be judged and go to hell. He will judge at the great white throne judgment and go to hell. Moses had already known this. Knowing that his name was written in the book of life, he was beseeching God at the risk of his, his eternal life. He asked God to save his people even if he had to go to hell. He asked for God's forgiveness. The people committed such a great sin before God, but still, he couldn't see his people being destroyed. So he asked God to forgive them to the point of laying down his own life for them. They have not believed God's being with Moses, neither have they obeyed and followed Moses. They were not thankful to Moses for his sacrifice for them, but rather complained and grumbled against him for having led them out of Egypt into the wilderness. When they sinned greatly before God, and when they were on the verge of destruction, Moses didn't hesitate to lay down his life for their salvation. Moses accomplished the highest level of goodness by which he could give even his life for his enemy. 
He wholly embraced the sin-filled people with that perfect goodness. That's why God the Father said he was more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Aren't you envious of his humbleness? How good it would be if we had humbleness that resembles God, our Lord, Moses, and prophets, and had no forms of evil. How pleased the Father God would be. I urge you to achieve such humbleness, all of you. Truly humbling yourself between spouses as well. How many people, how many people can you spiritually embrace? Have you ever quarreled with your children whom you gave birth to because you failed to embrace them? Have you done the same thing towards your brothers, sisters, or your spouse? Have you quarreled with them because you couldn't tolerate them? All church leaders who tend the souls as a parish pastor, group leader, mission leader, or cell leader, I urge you to look back on your life to see if you have taken care of them with humbleness. Whether you've harbored your souls or your flock with love and virtue and led them to heaven, or have you failed to embrace them because they disobeyed and were not to your liking in any given circumstances and even those who hurt you I hope you can harbor them and embrace them truly with love and with virtue only then can you transform even the even evil people and guide them to heaven if you truly understand the humbleness of Moses, you wouldn't blame the actions of others saying that they have done too much wrong to be embraced. A lot of people complain, although I've been patient with him over and over, he's going too far, I cannot forgive him anymore. What is so unforgettable? Why don't you forgive to the end? It's because you have no intention to forgive him at all. Why didn't you just forgive him in the first place without suppressing your feelings? Because you have some stumbling blocks and unbroken frameworks, you cannot embrace them but make a noise. Therefore, I pray in the name of the Lord that all of the church workers and congregation may take after Moses' humbleness and come forth as great vessels who can embrace many more souls. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the fourth goodness of Moses was that he was faithful in all God's household, as said in verse 7. Being faithful goes further than just fulfilling your duties completely. It is to carry out more than what you are entrusted with. Being faithful in all God's house means being faithful in all the areas where you belong. It's not being faithful in some areas, but not in others. It's being faithful in all areas where you belong. Women members, while you diligently work for God as a district leader, a cell leader, or a sub-district leader, you might fail to be faithful to your family. Putting the kingdom of God first, you should give timely meals to your children and do your duties well as a mother. Also, you should carry out your duties as a wife. And male members, no matter how busy you are at work, you should do your duties as a father and husband. While doing so, you should be faithful to God. And why? If you don't clean up the house, not even preparing meals in a timely manner, you shouldn't ask for your husband's understanding just because you have to be faithful to God. But if your husband comes into spirit and changes into a person with burning love for God, he will thoughtful. He will thoughtfully say, Honey, God's work should come first. You may come home late after visiting church members. 
If you leave everything prepared in the fridge, I'll prepare meals and eat for myself even if you come home late. So don't worry about it. <laughs> it would be better if your husband said like this, right? But it doesn't mean you can always let your husband do so. Anyway, God is pleased when you are faithful in all God's house. You shouldn't be faithful in one area while lazy in the other. It'll give grounds for Satan to bring you know, charges against you. To be faithful in all God's house, you must be able to sacrifice yourself without sparing your heart, efforts, time, and money. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 5 says, Now Moses was faithful in all, house, all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant. A servant means a person hired for some errands. So the word servant here indicates how much Moses lowered himself and how fully he was faithful to his God-given duties. His task, commissioned by God, was to lead the Israelites out of Egypt into the land of Canaan. Moses didn't become the leader for them because he himself wanted the position. He was chosen and called by the will of God. By the way, the Israelites didn't listen to his words carefully, nor did they obey and follow him. They complained and even quarreled with Moses over small difficulties and inconveniences. It was Moses' task to lead these stubborn people into the God-promised land of Canaan. A leader of people has a lot of burdens to bear. Sometimes he feels burdened and heavy laden by his task. Out in the world, when a company is in trouble, some people in the leadership hide themselves for their own survival. Some leaders cannot bear humiliation, despising attitudes, and complaints of their staff members, and finally commit suicide. It's not easy to bear all the burdens as a leader. Especially for weak-hearted people, it brings great anguish so much that they might give up even their lives. But Moses never evaded his responsibility, nor did he abandon his God-given duties. He passed through every kind of hardship by his faith in God. He didn't think he would simply lead them out of Egypt and take them to the land of Canaan. He cared for them with a fatherly heart and harbored them day and night as if he had given birth to them. He carefully considered how he would waken them up and how he would help them to become the kind of people that God desired them to be. But because their faith was so weak and they were far from the standard that God wanted, he always had to mourn and petition to God for them. He always had lamentation and agony toward these people. He also felt sorry for them. He couldn't feel relieved due to worries and anxieties about the people. He never rested, even for a moment, from the day he led them out of Egypt until the day when God called his soul. He shed an immeasurable amount of tears for them. His tearful prayers and mournful petitions for them are beyond description. What do you think he always prayed so earnestly for? He prayed that God would not give up on them, but continue to lead them within his will. Because Moses had this kind of heart, God trusted Moses too. So God had the fellowship with him and let him perform great works of power. Also in this church, God bestows great power on servants worthy of his trust and uses them, doesn't he?
For example, Pastor Chung Myo Ho of Africa, how greatly he is used by God. He educates a great number of chief leaders and pastors. He teaches the Word of God at Mammin seminaries set up across Africa. Many chief leaders and bishops are being trained by him as disciples. How amazing! The handkerchief brings together such a tremendous number of people. Unimaginable number of people receive Pastor Jung's prayer from the pulpit. Consequently, the blind come to see, the mute come to speak, and deaf come to hear. And the crippled stand up from wheelchairs, leaping and walking. So many people are healed of diseases, including AIDS and cancer, and they glorify God and convert to Christianity. Such works are happening. Why? Because God places His trust on this pastor, which means he has been demonstrating faith worthy of God's trust. He has been showing complete obedience. He's never defied my words. Suppose he's been in heading east, misunderstanding that it was God's will. But if I commanded him, you are wrong, go west, then he then obeys right away. In addition, he begins a fasting and repent. Also, he is faithful to the point of death. He prays day and night. With poor road conditions in Africa, cars rattle. In that rattling car, he has to drive 12 hours, 15 hours, or 20 hours to a neighboring country. He drives when he cannot travel by plane. Like this, he works day and night, prays and teaches a great number of pastors. He is working tirelessly, conducting many handkerchief prayer meetings. How couldn't God grant him such great power? It's no wonder he will be called great in the kingdom of heaven as well. By the way, Moses receiving the Ten Commandments, many decrees and statutes in his communication with God was not done easily. He went up to a desolate mountain and prayed and fasted for 40 days there. How could this happen easy? When he prayed to God with 40-day fasting, he didn't just pray quietly. He cried out with all his sincerity and might and made a desperate effort to understand more of God's heart. Power isn't just given automatically out of nowhere. Through this, through this prayer, he was given the five books of Moses. In addition to the five books, he received a lot of revelations from God, and he had close fellowship with God. He never spoke anything to the people without the consent and approval of God, and he thoroughly kept what God has said. Because Moses had this kind of inner heart, God spoke to Moses face to face, just like a man speaks to his friend, and he enjoyed deep fellowship with him. Was Moses courageous and pompous before God because he was fully faithful to all God's house? No, he never was. Among the first generation of the Israelites who were over 20 years old and escaped from Egypt, only two people entered the land of Kingha, and it was the second generation who conquered the promised land. The second generation of the Israelites could conquer it because Moses had led and taught them in faith. Nonetheless, he was always sorry before God for not reaping much more fruit. He felt sorry because he didn't bear greater and more perfect fruits, although God had bestowed much power on him and guaranteed him in many areas. Moses' heart was more humble than that of an unworthy servant who confesses, I have only done my duty, even after fulfilling all what was commanded. Usually, when people are praised or have accomplished something, you know, they are quick to become arrogant and put on airs. Yet, Moses, the more power, and the more love he received from God, the more he lowered himself and humbled himself. And God is searching for such people.
He wants such sons and daughters, such pastors and such church workers. God said he would forsake the arrogant. So what about you? Have you ever considered your duty too heavy and burdensome and wanted to abandon it and rest? Please, be reminded of the heart of Moses who had never rested comfortably because of concerns about his people. From the moment he had, he led them out of Egypt until the moment he was lifted up to heaven by God. I urge you to press on in your earnest, in earnest race of faith, remembering Moses, who had been faithful in all God's house, yet felt sorry before God for not reaping more fruit. To receive the commandments and the laws, Moses neither ate nor drank for 40 days. There was no way he couldn't find water on the high Mount Sinai. Joshua also followed his footsteps. That's how he received the commandments. But when he came down, his people, who were not patient, had created and worshipped a golden calf, before which they danced, ate, and drank. Enraged, God proclaimed that he would destroy them all. Even so, Moses knelt down before God, and he earnestly interceded for his people. God, please forgive them. If not, I want my life to be taken away. Please, blot me out from the book of life and save the people. When Moses offered up such prayer of love, risking his own life, how couldn't God be moved? How delighted God must have been. Even though he was to destroy all the people, he was moved by Moses' beautiful heart of love and faith. He was moved by Moses' goodness, by which he asked God to save the people, even if it meant he would go to hell. Seeing Moses' touching prayer in his heart, God lifted his curse and forgave the people. Let me conclude this message, dear brothers and sisters. Today, we have examined the two new aspects of Moses' goodness. He was more humble than anybody else on the face of the earth, and he was faithful in all God's house. Through today's message, we had a time to feel how great Moses' vessel was as a person who was chosen by God to fulfill his will. A saying that goes, Wind never stops blowing against the tree having many branches. Wind never stops blowing against the big tree. A taller, the taller and the bigger the tree, the more problems it faces. But a big tree has strong roots planted deep in the ground, and it stands firm in the face of the storms, even if the crown of its branches is toasted by the wind, and it can provide a shelter for many birds and supplies them with cool shade. I hope you will become such a great tree of faith. You can do it if you take Moses as your role model, resemble his goodness, and plant your faith deep into the Word of God. Jeremiah 17 verses 7 and 8 say, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. The verse says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. Has any of you failed to be blessed even if you acted accordingly? You involved your own thought in face of trouble? You trusted man rather than trusting God? You depended on your knowledge and thought? Did you indeed rely on the Lord God and display faith of trusting in Him alone? Despite doing so, have you failed to resolve your problems or receiving blessings? To this day, I haven't involved my thoughts in serving God. I haven't involved my thoughts or any of my experience. I've been marching on, trusting in and depending on the Lord God alone. Whether, whenever I did so, God was pleased and gave me blessing upon blessing. In China, there are many people who have been healed 
through my prayer, transcending space and time. And they ask, please set up a brain church in my area, in my area. Of course, that, can, that country is great, so there are many brain churches. But it, to, it would take like 10 or 15 hours by train to get there. So they ask us to set up brain churches there again and again. But they have grown up. They've never met me, but through the internet, they worshipped, and they received my prayer, and they were healed, and they set up a church. They make such requests. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes. But its leaves will be green, and you will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor cease to yield fruit. A tree planted by water, whether it is by a river or a stream, no matter how dry the land becomes, water remains in its roots, thereby keeping its you know, branches alive. A tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream, with its roots by a stream, it can observe water. That extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes. There is no fear of it being parched to death by heat and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green. It will not be anxious in the ear of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Likewise, those who take root in God and our Lord, those who offer all their hearts, will, and trust in God and our Lord, God is with them and guarantees them in everything. May you grow in such a great tree in faith so that you can be used as a precious instrument for the kingdom of God. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Let's receive senior pastor's prayer for the sick on screen. Lay your hand on the sick part of your body. If you are not sick, lay your hand on your chest and receive this prayer for the desires of your heart. Hallelujah, Almighty Father God of love. Please, lay your hands on those who are receiving this prayer now. By transcending space and time, show your works to your children who are receiving this prayer on the internet and through GCN in brain churches or local sanctuaries around the world. Give them the faith to believe and drive away their negative thoughts and doubts and drive away all their tests and trials. From head to toe, all entrail joints, nerve, tissues, and cells, whatever the sick part may be, burn them with the fire of the Holy Spirit and with the original light. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, all diseases, germs, and viruses, and infirmities, go away. May the light come. Scorch all their terminal and incurable diseases with the fire of the Holy Spirit. And drive away all endemic diseases such as malaria. All contagious diseases such as cold, flu, and fever go away. Father, protect them from all kinds of germs and viruses. Heal them of stomach, lung, liver, breast, uterine, intestinal, and all other cancers. AIDS, leukemia, cerebral apoplexy, high and low blood pressure, diabetes, thyroid, heart, and lung diseases, and women's diseases, and all inflammations be cleansed and go away. Heal them of polio, stroke, arthritis, and herniated discs. Back pain, headache, neuralgia, and all other pains go away. Epilepsy, autism, depression, neurosis, and other mental diseases go away. All kinds of paralysis be loosened. You get up, walk, and leap. Let the eyes see well, let the ears hear well. Let the blind come to see, the deaf come to hear, and mute come to speak. Heal them of after effects of all kinds of accidents and fix their broken bones. Let the heat and burning sensation go away. Restore them from burns and let there be no burning scar left. All kinds of drug addictions, poisoning, and substance abuse go away. Let the dead nerves, tissues, and cells be regenerated and bring the dead back to life.
Give him the blessing of conception. May you receive the blessing of conception. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan and the ruler of the air, go away. And their servants also go away. Go away, you evil, unclean, false, and deceitful spirits, separating spirits and all forces of darkness. Loosen the bonds of wickedness. Darkness, you go away. May the light come. Father God, give them strength to cry out in prayer, to cast off sin, and to be sanctified. As their spirit and soul prosper, let all things go well with them, and let their family be evangelized. Protect them from all kinds of accidents and disasters, and bless them to lead a prosperous life without any problems. With the firewall of the Holy Spirit, with the heavenly hosts and angels, and with your blazing eyes, protect all of your children, their family, their workplace, and business. Give our students wisdom and understanding and give them fervent passion to study hard. Keep their hearts and minds from the worldly things and bless our students to love Father God all the more fervently. Whether your children eat or drink or whatever they may do, let them do it all for the glory of Father God. Let them say, I met God, I experienced God, I received answers and blessings. Let them testify with their lips like this. Father God, thank you. Be glorified alone. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. 